to me to tell you what made me take the case is kind of an interesting. Go. Uh, when I initially heard about the case and from a nurse, I sort of didn't believe that something like this could sort of go on, and I wasn't really going to look into it. And so what happened that changed the course of my life was a story in the Los Angeles Times that Saturday. And the story said that they had just arrested a pharmacist for hiring a hitman to assassinate the administrator of Ranchos Los Amigos Hospital, which was for serious physical injuries. And the reason that he was to be assassinated was that he was scheduled to testify that the pharmacist tried to bribe him to refer long-term patients to certain nursing homes. And when I read that, I said to myself, maybe I should call that nurse back. <laughs> and end of writing career, and here comes law. second case, the second big thing you did was? Sinra. Okay. And we're here to talk about it. Tell me about it. How'd you get involved? Well, when that nursing home case ended, I sort of felt that maybe I had more. I sort of felt what I brought was journalistic investigative skills to law and that I could investigate as a journalist, which uh, was something that most lawyers don't really have and I got a job offered at a pretty good firm and uh, I took it and uh, one day uh, a woman who was in a pre-psychotic state got referred into Sinanon. Uh She shaved off all her hair, took her into a locked room and then put her on a bus the next morning to their facilities in Marin County. Notified the husband that she had joined and and that he was not allowed to see her or talk to her. And he had a neighbor who said, I know a lawyer who got a lot of Skid Row alcoholics out of nursing homes. Maybe he can get your wife out of Synanon. And so on a Monday came that phone call. And uh, he was crying. And somewhere in the crying, I said to him, I'll get your wife back. And that's how it began. Let's talk about Synanon. How did Synanon start? We're here in Southern California. Tell me all about the place started. Who, well, who was Chuck Dedrick? Charles Dedrick was born in Maumee, Ohio in 1913. The most significant event that would lead to everything happened in 1917 when his father died in an automobile accident, which was a pretty good feat since I don't think that a uh, car drove too fast in 1917. He stumbled to a, uh, to a hotel room and uh, rather than going to a hospital, and then he died overnight. His mother, uh, he was the oldest of three kids, and his mother put him in the father role in the family, which when she came home, she spoke to Chuck. She stayed up, talked about her problems to Chuck. She was a concert pianist, um, sort of aristocratic, nice, you know, a uh, woman with a German background. And, um, but four years later, Chuck's youngest uh, brother died of influenza, which killed a lot of kids in the 1930s. And I think for Chuck, uh, that responsibility that was so strong at too early of an age uh, led to him to such a feeling of guilt that he never bonded with his own children any children or one children around him uh, for the rest of his life. He only bonded with his children when they became adults. Four years later, tragedy strikes again and uh, his mother remarries and he loses the role that he had with his mother. Uh, why do I think all this is significant? Because I can tell you that in the early days of Sanan, when people kicked cold turkey, uh, Diedrich 
told them that their problem was is they were still in love with their mother and was having Oedipus complex meetings in the uh, 1950s. But back to your question, uh, Diedrich, as a result of his new stepfather, as a teenager, began to drink, uh, began to be a rebel rouser. He flunked out of Notre Dame. He got a job in sales. He got married. He had a child. He lost his wife. Um, finally, um, he decides to become a beach bum in Santa Monica and drives out from Ohio, but still gets a job for the Hughes uh, tool company, gets married again, she leaves him, and one day he's found uh, down and out drunk on the kitchen floor, and someone says, Fatso, if you don't go to AA, you're going to die. And not only does he go to AA, but he becomes an AA fanatic, and he becomes a man, he's got a sense of humor, style, timing. They love him until they get sick of him. And uh, he then has an experience on the road doing sales where he finds a book of self-reliance by Emerson, and he um, uh, believes it's a special message on how to live. He quits his job and dedicates himself to trying to help alcoholics recover. He went to the next step which was a Dr. Keith Dittman, we're talking about mid-50s, was experimenting with a new drug that he thought might help uh, alcoholics, and the drug was LSD. Diedrich volunteered, and then later, as he was A, he believed that the, he saw the meanings of the world, you know, there's no good, there's no bad, and he saw insights. He went to the library, he studied philosophy, he studied, you know, psychology, and his speeches began to take a uh, psychological or philosophical overtone rather than the AA religious overtone, and he developed his own following. Eventually they would come to his apartment, eventually they formed sort of an encounter group that had rules of attacking people's behavior. Uh, you could say anything you want to cause an effect, it did not have to be true uh, or not. The only limitation was, was no violence and no threat of violence. Some addicts came around and initially stopped using. AA would not allow addicts at that time. The belief was they were not curable. Uh, Lexington had a 95% failure rate. Diedrich decided AA already exists, so he tossed out the alcoholics, kept the addicts. Uh, they had a, uh, a small place in Venice that they rented with a hose going through a window for a shower and getting donated uh, food off of sale trucks and uh, some, some girls did tricks on the street and money was put together in a pot and some old timers, drug addicts, found their way to the doors that finally had had enough and made a commitment to get off drugs and uh, the birth of Synanon and the birth of the drug rehab industry as it exists, exists, exists today began just as I told you. Ready to go? Mm -hmm. Isn't that fucking great? Does it sound familiar? No violence, no threat of violence, but you could say anything you wanted to? You just couldn't tell your parents. Just couldn't tell your parents. All okay. right, roll. Well, if you want to just sit up straight, sir. Okay. There we go. Mm -hmm. We're ready to go. Yeah, we're rolling. I should also tell you about in the game, out of the game. Yeah, let's, let's talk. Let me, let me, let's go back through that for a second. That was beautiful. Um, we're, sorry, we're going, we're going. Um, they had, tell me about the name, tell me two things. First, the name Synanon, and second, we'll talk about the game. Synanon. Okay, well, initially it was called the uh, Tender Loving Care Club. And um, uh, one day, uh, one, uh, one great, I think it was Gray Thompson, uh, somebody, they were going to, play, it wasn't called the game at that time. And so, sometimes they called them seminars, and sometimes they called them symposiums. And, and some, was in using the, the synonym word dopamine, uh, slurred the words together and came out, it's time for a synonym. And uh, Diedrich liked it, and they went out in the sand and drew in the sand different versions of how they could spell it. And then, you know, they drew a logo, and then one day the sign went up on the little ocean front. It said Synanon Foundation. They incorporated it in 1958, I believe it was. Uh, they opened a bank account, I think, with something like $100. And the first bill they paid was for electricity. 
and some people said Camelot had arrived. Okay, you <laughs> oh, rolling, sir. Okay, rolling. Camelot. I can't yeah. believe that you would think that. Oh, no, no. It was, at that time, it was the correct um, uh, general view. It was, uh, Life Magazine would, would, four years later, would do a 14 page, page spread on Synanon as the, uh, uh, as, uh, you know, this miracle fact in, in Congress. A congressman stood up and said, Mr. President, there is a miracle on the beach. And Synanon was the very first place in history that drug addicts stopped using drugs. And uh, they were, uh, they took people in, people who didn't have money, people who had nowhere to go, and uh, they were put through the Synanon system, and they were, uh, they drastically changed and were living good lives. Synanon was experimenting in uh, uh, different types of educations or educational processes. A lot of people were volunteering, people were experts were volunteering to come down and uh, lecture on different subjects. The uh, Hollywood had discovered Synanon and all sorts of Robert Wagner and Leonard Nimoy and, and all sorts of people were coming down, but I think they liked the idea of playing a game with ex-addicts and ex-prostitutes, ex, uh, but it was also, there was this general belief that Synanon had made a great discovery, and I think through the beginnings of Synanon through the late 1960s, Synanon had a reputation of something that America was proud of and was looked upon as, you know, apple pie. It was like, you know, there goes Synanon and let's all clap our hands. There was a movie made on Charles Diedrich in 1962 with Edmund O'Brien playing Charles Diedrich. And it was all about the birth, growth of Synanon and what a great man Diedrich was and how he had um, uh, uh, saved all these people's lives and developed a system which is a big part of the system that exists today in drug rehabs. But th today's drug rehabs have certain important distinctions from Synanon because ultimately Synanon was to go bad and uh, there's this fork in the road where Synanon went one way and the ideas of Diedrich, initial ideas, went another way. And uh, so while Synanon is the discovery, Synanon is also the discovery of the failure of brainwashing. <coughs> what is the game? I mean, what is the Synanon system? Because you said that there's a system, and, you, and, and to, my, to my mind, it's shocking uh, that this was looked at so favorably. But the way you describe well, it, they quit drugs, but what was the not, system? Not, first of all, not everyone looked upon it favorably. There were a lot of critics and a lot of people that were accusing Synanon of, of brainwashing. And the one that was most interesting, I think it was around 63, 64, maybe 62, I don't know, that uh, uh, Louis Yablonsky, a sociologist, wrote the book, The Tunnel Back, which uh, glorified uh, Synanon and explained probably the best of anything ever written, the Synanon system. And he even wrote in there that uh, a session between him and Charles Diedrich, where they acknowledged that they were brainwashing and compared it to Lifton's work on the prisoners of war in, in Korea. It wasn't like they weren't aware of it. And, um, but they described the harsh attacks of the Synanon game, the busting of people, punishments that were put out, the demands for conformity, the concept of act as if, which means don't try to figure out if right or wrong, but just trust. Uh, that you've been a loser all your life and nothing you've ever done has ever got you anywhere so you must just do exactly as we say that Sinan is the only place that can uh, uh, you can survive uh, but the system basically in Sinan is largely rewards and punishment you reward good behavior and you punish bad behavior the rewards can be good and the biggest part of the reward would be is a raise of status amongst your peers in your group, and the worst punishment would be a demotion, which would also be in front of your friends, peers, and group. A, uh, a synonym haircut would be to stand a person up in front of him and just tear him apart. A general meeting was to do it 
in front of the entire house. And that way, what Dietrich called was a carom shot. The attack on his behavior would ricochet and affect everyone's behavior. Sometimes the house could be woken up at three in the morning, made to do general assemblies, and someone would be pulled out for a haircut in front of a general, a general meeting. It was a very harsh, pressurized place that uh, people were told that you can't live if, unless you're here, but because you're here, you're better than everyone else. And a person who left was called a spati. He, uh, he was to be shunned. Uh, uh, he was no longer a friend of Sinanon. And if something happened to the guy, if he went back to drugs, it would be posted on a wall. So you know this is what happens to you if you leave. Now, a sociologist named Edgar Frydenberg wrote that um, uh, uh, that I know nothing, he wrote in The Nation, it was a book review of Yablonsky's book, and he wrote, I know nothing about Synanon except what Mr. Yablonsky, Dr. Uh, Mr. Yablonsky, I guess, wrote. And he said, uh, that it raises a question to me of the humanity of Mr. Yablonsky for his failure to see the horror of what he is writing. He then compared it to brainwashing and, and uh, Dr. Lifton's work on the prisoners of war in Korea and said that uh, they were trading one addiction for another, that instead of being bound to drugs, they were being bound to Sinanon, and that one day, he predicted, there would be a state of mind in Sinanon that would be more important than the club itself. In other words, he predicted what happened to Sinanon solely from Yablonsky's book. So there were many people that uh, also, there were people who wanted Sinanon uh, destroyed, uh, because they didn't want a, a, a beam light attracting drug addicts all over the country to Santa Monica, let them drop out and then do burglaries and sell, sell drugs to the kids, which, by the way, did happen. Uh, but that paranoia, whether justified or not, results in a lot of unfair attacks on Sinanon in its early days by society that ultimately would lead to the paranoia inside Sinanon, which would ultimately uh, lead to the reign of terror and violence that would occur between 1974 and 1978. Before Sinanon, Diedrich had uh, been divorced by his first wife and then divorced by his second wife, who was later murdered by her boyfriend in front of Chuck Diedrich's daughter, Dady. And he probably didn't have... Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, the way that J.D. got into sitting on his daughter was, um, uh, she was, I think, about 12 or 13, and her, her mother broke up with her boyfriend, and he came to the apartment and shot her uh, while uh, J.D. was watching. And uh, uh, J.D. then became... Uh, moved into Sinanon and got to know her father and, and rose to be, you know, the president of Sinanon, you know, and, uh, but that's how she got in. For Diedrich, I don't think that his first two wives were great love affairs, but his third wife, Betty, who was a black woman, uh, at a time when I'm not so sure that the word black had yet enter, entered our, our, our language, uh, and at a time in which black and white marriages were not as popular or as acceptable. Uh, Diedrich chose her as his third wife. Some people thought that uh, he did it for that political reason. Uh, to, uh, but others that I've talked to uh, believe that Chuck very much loved her. And she was felt to be a woman who uh, could calm him down and uh, uh, but as time grew on, they lived on thrones. Uh, they were, she was the high priestess of Sinanon. She was worshipped by the community. And uh, she also know and knew about the training of the Sinanon Imperial Marines and their purposes. Uh, when she died of cancer in 1977, Diedrich was by her bedside and giving her marijuana cigarettes to cure, to help her fight off. Uh, the pain. 
And uh, when she died, the whole community mourned. But the next step was that Diedrich decided to have a new life. So he announced that he was interviewing for the position. And many of the women in Synanon came to be interviewed for the job of his wife. And uh, Diedrich at that time was about, uh, probably about my age, uh, in his early 60s, and he uh, picked Ginny Sharen, who was 31, and I guess that's his power because, well, I may be his same age now, I don't think I could get a 31-year-old. But uh, they started their romance, and, uh, and Diedrich would announce, by now, in addition to the game, they had a system in Sinan called the think table, where at breakfast and at dinner, a microphone held in front of Diedrich, and he would just talk to the community. It would be recorded. And a system called the wire, and the wire was a closed circuit station that had speakers in every room, in Sinanon, at all facilities, bathrooms, hallways, and that it ran 24 hours. This was Big Brother. This was it finally really happening. And the talk on it was, we're fighting the enemy, just like in 1984, you know, what the legal staff is doing, how we're saving the world, who has left, who has done bad, and Diedrich's philosophy was being repeated over and over again. And now the philosophy was, I'm having, you know, love with a stranger, you know. Uh, supposedly there was some little difficulty in performance, but that was not allowed to be discussed in the games. But the, uh, uh, Diedrich then announced, you know, I've had two divorces and a death. What if we, we since I've proven that you can have a relationship with a stranger, what if we just separate every three years and pick a new mate? Maybe we'll never have to suffer death or divorce. So he then implemented that notion. And first, the fact, I think he made his daughter, J.D., break up with her mate and take someone else who Diedrich always thought was better for her anyway. Uh, and then, like dominoes, they begin to move. Eventually, getting to a community that has a blackboard up and has the names of all the big people and their relationships and, the, and they would ask questions, okay, who do you think should be with John? You know, or who would be good for Mary? And then they would be ordered to go out. People would have to say goodbye to their wife of 10 or 15 years and go off with a stranger. Now some guys who wanted a younger woman probably were pretty excited about it, but a lot of people were horrified. And some did leave. Dan and Marion Ross, who I think had been married for that time for 20 some odd years, and they were in their 50s or whatever, they walked out. There were people that did walk out. And I told you about, you know, you know Ben Parks. So uh, now we have Skinner's system has gone awry. Diedrich is a man who has never been said no to for all these years, and his mind and his imagination is free upon this community. And just as any idea, whether or not it was aerobics, non-smoking, non-sugar, whatever it was, is going to work. It's going to be vasectomies, abortions, give up your wife, and the next step comes violence. Quick pause. Let's, let's take a, a, a slight detour and, uh, and just outline. Uh, for, first, this is just a separate little capsule. Can you tell me, are you rolling? Yes. Thank you, sir. CED, can you tell me about uh, those initials and, and their significance inside of an internal document? Um, Charles Diedrich was known by many names. He was the founder. Uh, he was uh, the chairman of the board. Uh, and, uh, but probably the, uh, the biggest reference to him was CED, uh, particularly in writing. Uh, he's, he, a lot of times he wouldn't sign his stuff, but even if he did, it was usually over CED. Memos that uh, would circulate through the foundation in reference to Diedrich would use CED, meaning Charles Edwin Diedrich. Um, keep going. Now, did he ever have a, can you tell me about any schools that he might have found? Uh, there was the uh, Charles Edwin Diedrich School of Law uh, that eventually came into existence. In California, 
there's a certain amount of requirements to fulfill that you can be what's called an uncredited law school versus, you know, uh, it's like Southwestern, I think. Maybe you finally got graduation, but was uncredited. It takes longer to graduate from an uncredited law school, but if the law school meets the requirements. Today, there are law schools that are online. Um, so uh, at that time, I sent on to build its, uh, its legal staff with all its legal wars. Uh, began to build its school to train more lawyers to take these paralegals. And, and I believe at some point in time, uh, they uh, uh, began to attract outside people who were actually enrolling. And, and I think at one time I read that uh, they actually had a pretty good high rate passing the bar. Right, pause. Uh, can you say, you don't have to pause. Uh, you, uh, keep rolling. Say one more time, uh, just on internal documents, and if you could just say CED. By the way, Ben Parks yeah. said that they knew all about CEDU, that it was discussed inside of Synanon, and that he knows about it, and that it was well regarded inside of Synanon, just yeah. by the way, yeah. Ben Parks. So if you can just say again, if you, if you, if I had an internal document from Synanon, and it said CED, what would that refer to? It would be Charles Diedrich, and it was capital C, capital E, capital D, Charles Edwin Diedrich. And that was the way that he was referred to in writing. Sometimes it might be the founder or the chairman, but most of the time it was CED. And uh, sometimes it was even Diedrich signed his name over CED. It was the most popular way of uh, referencing Charles Diedrich. Love it. Uh, take a quick pause. He's got a story to tell. <laughs> in, uh, in 19, by 1974, the IRS had been to question if Sinon really was a new society and not um, uh, taking in, uh, you know, doping so much anymore. Why shouldn't it be paying taxes? Why should it have its nonprofit status? And so Sinon was in a dilemma. And so one day, one of the members of the legal department wrote a memo on should Synanon become a religion? And in the memo, it was written that uh, there would be a new reason to, that we would not have to pay taxes. It would end such silly questions as, why does no one leave and why does everyone have to obey? And then the last thing on the memo, handwritten, was the question, if we become a religion, who will be God? And that was the birth of Synanon three the new religion. Going to the Bible. Um. At, the, at the same time, at the same year, to further boost their position of not paying taxes, uh, Sinan began to contact the probation departments to try to uh, recruit uh, uh, juveniles who would otherwise go, go to you know, juvenile facilities instead save the tax repairs money, send them to us and use our rehabilitation methods and courts and juvenile departments began sending kids to Sinanon. Sinanon called them the punks and they put, called them the punk squad and they were marched and taken militarily and had like military. Diedrich had believed that his own son had grown up in the military and liked the idea of marching troops and, uh, but he had a problem. Old time dopings who had come to Synanon wanted to get off drugs. People who had donated their money, the squares, wanted to be in the new society. And streetwise, punks wanted the hell out of there. And the system was not working so well on the kids. They were street smart. And uh, they're not buying you know, all this dogma that's coming out and they're acting smart ass and disrespectful. So finally, the rule against violence is amended. And it is announced that to quicken the education of these people and to stop them from being a threat to us is well, hit them. Hit them in the face. Knock them down. You know. But afterwards, take them into a game and have them gamed about the experience. And this will be, this will get them into line. I have to retract and go back to 
1960 when the first book appeared on Sunam by uh, Dr. Daniel Castrell, who was a psychologist who was allowed into Sunan. And he wrote at the, at the end of his book that he decided to do psychological testing on the old timers in Sunan. And to his surprise, he found that they were still antisocial, even though they were behaving as model citizens. Uh, he believed that. Uh, that the people should get psychological treatment and so on, that they should have a open up more graduate and follow up programs, and that the pressures of the game should be lowered. Diedrich said, no, no, no. Casserell left, started Daytop back east, and implemented those changes. And that's the fork in the road where drug rehab started, and Sinanon, the original grandfather, hooks and curves down. And uh, so now, if you accept Casserell's contentions that nobody internally changed in Sinanon, but were just conforming to the pressures of the environment, what did that mean once you said it's okay to hit somebody in the face? It was the good days are back. You know, uh, I have been taught that this is wrong behavior, that I will be punished, and now I'm being taught it is right behavior for what I'll be rewarded. And from there, it then became the next step was if you got caught stealing something from Sinanon, it was a short visit to say, we can take some, remember the general meetings? You put somebody up there and you give them a haircut and it caroms off. Now you have a general meeting and you put the kid on the stage and three guys come up and beat the hell out of them in front of the audience. The only next step that came after that was well, we're tired of these people who keep saying we can't do this and we can't do that and write about us or steal from us when they leave and go off. And uh, we're going to teach them a lesson. And uh, it began one day when a, uh, uh, the signal went out in, uh, that uh, someone in a purple truck had almost run off some sitting on bicycle, bicycle people on the road. And cars and trucks went off to every town in, in Marin County searching for a purple truck. And in the town, I think it was Tamales, they found a purple truck. And through walkie-talkies, all the Sinanon people assembled, kind of like a western town. They brought the guy out and accused him. He said he didn't do it. And then finally someone threw a punch. And suddenly there was this western brawl on the town. The, the town people fighting and duking it out with the Sinanon people until finally the sheriffs, you know, arose. There was a farmer named Alvin Gambanini who was helping the punks when they would escape to get back to their parents. They would tell horror stories and he would get them back. So Alvin Gambanini was sort of public enemy number one and Diedrich would refer to him as, the, uh, as a, uh, as a uh, psychological pig, you know, uh, you know, running on his farm and would always be denouncing him. And so one night uh, Alvin Gambanini came back to check on his property and suddenly his car was rammed into a ditch. His family was in the car and they began to jump on his car, swing hammers at it, smash windows. It was like a scene on a clockwork orange. Alvin was being beaten through the window on, on his face, his mouth. His wife threw him himself to try to cover his face to, to save him. And one of his sons got out the back window and uh, outran the crowd and got help and uh, brought back the sheriffs. And uh, Diedrich wrote a memo, which we have to Mike Garrett, who was the head of the Synanon uh, Security, the son of Dan Garrett, the head legal counsel of Synanon, and said, Mike, uh, I'm very proud of the way that uh, uh, our neighboring pig was handled. And uh, the Synanon people who did get arrested and got jail sentences were treated as heroes when they came back. And after that, there was incident after incident. Young kids hit a Sinanon post. When they came back, their car was dragged on Sinanon property. When they went in to get the car, mobs descended upon them. One got away and was chased down in the town. He was on the telephone booth calling his parents when they descended upon him, ripped him out, and beat him up uh, on the ground. In Santa Monica, two surfers uh, slept in a van so they could get up early for the beach on Sinanon property they were attacked and beaten when they got woke up. 
The same day, uh, four blacks came down to the beach and went through the Sunan parking lot, beaten, chased, teeth knocked out. Uh, it was just uh, one incident after another. Ultimately, from Sunan's own records, I have documented 87 violent attacks by Sinan between 1974 and 1978. Iran, uh, uh, one time uh, Cardinal came back on his honeymoon to show his wife where he was rehabilitated. Uh, he had trespassed on property, he was tied to a post and beaten while his wife was held in a car with a guard dog. Uh, uh, there was a Ron Edson, he almost got into a he was Ron Edson, a typical old Western type farmer, and uh, uh, somebody honked at him and flipped a finger at him, thinking he was a bad driver. And with his family, he chased them down and asked all four Sinan guys to come out and fight him at once. <laughs> and uh, the next thing, they tracked him down to find out who he was. Dr. Doug Robeson, who was the head of the Imperial Marines, he's now a doctor in Seattle. He's never been brought to justice in the memos that we have tape recordings we have. He contacted Robeson and said, you're going to apologize. And uh, Robeson refused to apologize. He says, well, I tried to warn you. I tried to help you, you know, but we have a lot of people who are angry. And when Robeson got off the phone, we had the Sinan memo saying who it was who got in the car and who drove to his property. They held his family at gunpoint while they pistol whipped him in the ground. And, uh, you know, later Phil Ritter, who tried to do something about the bisectomies, was now trying to get his daughter out. And uh, they were beating him with clubs to death. And the only thing that saved his life is somebody walked upon the scene and began to scream. And then two and a half weeks later, I got the rattlesnake. And then it ended. Well, I didn't expect you to jump there. Wait a second. Okay. Stop. Um, I need a little more of where you had been during that time. I got to the bed. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, have a drink. Have a drink. All right. I just need a little bit of where you, right. what you had been doing during that time. All right. It wasn't All right. you were involved. Okay. You tell me when you were involved. My involvement in Synodon. Oh, One second. By 1977, Diedrich had announced that they were going to do it better and that there was going to be a policy of getting the message out. Don't mess with Sinan. Uh, we'll get you because there's too many people in Sinan that love Sinan and they're going to do it on their own. And they're never going to tell that they're being directed by, by management. And, and in the Depot Flats in Visalia, uh, a group of young men, including Lance Kenton, son of band leader Stan Kenton and Joe Musico, were trained to be the Sinan Imperial Marines, which was their general hit force. And eventually, it was the Imperial Marines who got Phil Ritter, Imperial Marines that went after me. The Imperial Marines went on trips to, to attack people from coast to coast, from California to New York. And, uh, and then the Imperial Marines began to train the National Guard, which is the eternal Sunan force. Just like Manson, they were paranoid in belief of that there was going to be this attack. They used to even do uh, war games where people would come to attack to test the National Guard security force. The organization was under complete paranoia. And, um, uh, uh, What were you doing legally? Well, you know, when I get involved in 1977, the Imperial Marines already exist. And I remember there was somebody, maybe a week after I'm involved, the next sitting on there, Dietrich kept talking about me on the wire and uh, after I got that woman out. And so now when people left Sinanon, they knew who to go to. So I'm hearing all this stuff, and this one girl tells me about the Imperial Marines and the hit forts attacking the enemies. And after she left, I walked back to the office and I started laughing. I said, you can't believe the story I just heard. And I started laughing, you know. Obviously, she's a nutcase, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, it took me maybe six, seven months, but somewhere by 1978 and early 78, I knew it was true. And uh, I was, uh, even though they weren't even necessarily related to my cases against Sinanon, I was tracking every event that I heard 
contacting the victims, contacting the witnesses, gathering the notes, knowing that um, uh, I was going to have to prove to the authorities that this criminal conspiracy existed within Synanon, and that uh, one guy up in Visalia had gone to the authorities and told them, and they all on tape, and they just threw the tape in the corner. They didn't believe him either. And uh, so Synanon was apple pie. Synanon was Synanon. And how was I going to prove that my life was in danger and that other people's lives were in danger? And so my life became full time. There was a point I realized that I crossed the point of no return. That I was going to survive, or Synanon was going to survive, but it wasn't going to be the both of us. And uh, it was a very terrible and horrible feeling. I remember I, to have to tell that to my mother and to my fiancé at the time uh, was, was very, very hard. And um, um, after a rescue of these three kids out of Synodon involving the San Francisco police in, in uh, summer of 78, uh, uh, one of the kids that I got out, 15 years old, Joy Butler, called me to tell me that uh, they're going to kill me. And uh, later, people in, like Ben Parks, who could speak to people in Synod, would tell me, they got your address. They know where you live. Uh, uh, a lawyer whose nephew was a lawyer in Synod calls me and says, Paul, I've got it on pretty good information. You know, they're coming for you. And then Phil Ritter gets attacked. And I know that they want me more than Phil Ritter. At that time, sorry. I'm uh, ready. Yep. Um, so sorry about that. You know, it's uh, I've been t told that uh, that I suffer uh, post stress, uh, you know, syndrome, and and uh, the thing was is that at the time of these events, there was never time for tears. There wasn't something a luxury that you had. You were just always on the move and always planning to survive, and. Uh, Emotions were never really released, and sometimes now, when you look back and realize the horrible position that you were in, uh, what never came out then comes out now. Uh, I knew they were coming for me, and I lived a life where I didn't start my car without checking underneath the car and around it. I was so careful crossing the street. I stayed away from windows. I, uh, I remember at nights if my dogs barked, uh, uh, having to try to search the property and being scared. I remember a friend coming over one day and he couldn't believe it when he saw the shotgun lying by my bed. I never had owned a weapon. And I remember going into a gun shop and saying, I don't know what to do, but do you have something that are four people came through the doorway that might get them with one shot. And, uh, you know, later years I finally threw that shotgun away. Now I wish I kept it, maybe I could put it on eBay. <laughs> but the, uh, 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 it was, the two weeks were the horribles in, in my life and um, uh, uh, a lot of people didn't believe me. And I had some people who did, and uh, I had LAPD intelligence behind me because of something I had done with Bowling Est. And um, the very day of the attack, I had come from a meeting with the terrorist division in the Attorney General's office, and the uh, uh, and the two members of LAPD intelligence. It also helped that uh, people like Ben Parks and a lot of Synodon members uh, suddenly, when you know, had the courage to uh, after the Phil Ritter attack to uh, sign a petition and documenting the attacks and telling the authorities that's happening. You know, and so the authorities were probably just starting to pick up on it. You know, when Ritter got attacked, there was a newspaper reporter in Berkeley who raised the question, was it Synanon? You know, and uh, 
but uh, and the media was alerted enough by me, you know, I mean, I was spilling my guts to Narda Zakina of the LA Times, who was already writing about Sinanon, and to Connie Chung. And so the media was somewhat sort of onto it at that point. So that when the news broke that I was bitten by a rattlesnake, the media knew who did it, and uh, everyone knew who did it. And that launched, you know, you know, SWAT teams and, and uh, specialized Brown forces to invade Sinan, and uh, it was uh, it was like raid on Entebbe. Tell me the story. What happened? I'm just very horribly, morbidly curious. They were how did they get a, a snake like that? And, and well, you know, the interesting thing was is that uh, uh, to to tell the little story is that uh, once the soldier. That uh, Diedrich used to say that he was cursed by uh, dope, fiend, dope, dope fiend labor who only had four fingers, meaning that they were incompetent. And uh, Doug Robeson, uh, Howard Garfield, who was number one at uh, Harvard and, uh, and second in command in the Synodon Legal Department, wrote a memo to Doug Robeson saying that uh, uh, the doctor who was the head of the Imperial Marines to gather up all Sinanon's own internal memos describing their violence and their policies of getting the enemies, to bring them to the legal department so they could hide it under the attorney-client privilege. Robeson executes a memo to Garfield saying the job has been done. But he did it with dope fiend labor. So eventually, when ABC is involved in litigation with Sinanon, uh, Sinanon allows them to avoid all these motions and sanction motions to go into the warehouse in San Francisco and just copy anything you want in our documents. And they were all there. And everything, you know, the people who were working at night, you know, seeing boring stuff, boring stuff, and all of a sudden there's a memo from Dr. Douglas Robeson, take them down in the basement and beat them up and teach them a letter on manners. Dan Garrett, you know, kidnap that guy and bring him back to the camp. Uh, board of Minute me meetings, you know, we have to, plan better our attacks on the enemies. And one of the things that came out was the diary of Wendell Stamps, who was an Imperial Marine. And in that diary, he talks about them catching rattlesnakes in, in, in Barzellia and Badger Mountains, and that they would play with them, put them in holes and sort of see their activity, and that one day, Doug Robeson, the good Dr. Doug Robeson, gives a lecture on what the rattlesnake venom will do to a human being. So, uh, I suffered from vanity. Uh, I thought I was uh, young, handsome, and good-looking, and the last thing I wanted to do was wear glasses. And back in those days, uh, contact lenses were a little bit harder than they are now, and they wore you, wore you down. I figured, short drive to my office, so what, that I can't read a street sign, and I just often just didn't wear anything. So when I came home that day from the meeting, and I, there's a sort of a grill over the mailbox inside the house, uh, all I could think about was the start of the Dodger uh, Yankee World Series, you know, with Steve Garvey and Davey Lopes and all my favorite, you know, baseball players. And uh, uh, as I walked to the kitchen, I saw inside the grill that something elongated was in there. And I remember thinking, I believe that if I had glasses or my contact lenses, I would have seen what it was. So vanity got me, so to speak. But the, I thought maybe a scarf, and I, mean, I thought maybe an elongated package. I put my books down in the kitchen, and I came back, and I opened the grill, stuck my hand in, and I was actually had my hand on it. And all of a sudden, the head comes out in my view and strikes me on the hand. And then I shout and drop and coiled up on the. I looked at it, looked at it, and then I looked at my hand to verify that I was bit. And you ever play uh, uh, Jim Rummy and you make a discard, you say, You want to take the card back? It's like, Can we roll this film back, you know, please? You know, nothing like this can work. I mean, I'm doing all this security, all this safety stuff, and they get me with a rattlesnake in the mailbox, you know. My friends today say to me, well, who would expect a rattlesnake in the bell box? I said, yeah, but bomb? 
<laughs> you know, it could have been a bomb in the mailbox. I knew it was odd shaped. Why didn't I get down there and look at it? Why in this one moment was I just totally off guard? And that's and the next thing that happened was uh, my pattern when I came home was that my border collies, uh, Tommy and Devin, would greet me at the door and go out and play in the front. After about 20 minutes, they would come back and I would shut the door. So they were outside. And when I screamed, they were charging full speed. And the snake was at the doorway. And I had to reach over the snake while it was coiled and slam the door shut on my dogs. Then, at that point, I thought about, um, well, uh, someone's, I, had to, I wanted to secure the house but leave the sliding glass door open because someone's going to have to come in and kill the snake. Then I went out through the side door and I screamed to my neighbor, Edie, call 911, get an ambulance. I've been bitten by a rattlesnake. It's Seminon. And uh, uh, the, I had read or learned that you were supposed to get ice. And I remember outside, uh, apparently I actually, with my shoulder, it unhinged Edie's front door, trying to get in to get ice into her house. Neighbors came out and pulled me onto the street. And uh, fortunately, I had a, a professor across the street who that day or that week had taken a course on rattlesnake venom training and some safety course you know, at, at the university that he taught. And he took a knife and you know, dug out and tied a tourniquet you know, around my arm. And I was still screaming for ice. And I think when the ambulance got there, they had to go like this through all the ice to find me because neighbors were bucketing, pouring buckets of ice you know, all over on top of me, you know. And, uh, and I was concerned about Nardis Aquino, who was an LA Times reporter, who they thought we were, you know, cahoots with. And uh, I was worried that if they'd gone this crazy now to get me, which was an act of such self-destruction, that, you know, sort of like the godfather, you know, today's the day we get all our enemies. And I was telling people that Narda had to be warned. Someone had to call Narda. I remember being very uh, uh, concerned for her. And, uh, you know, nothing, nothing. Show me. there's a story about Narda. I, I don't know if it was really germane. I don't know. Show me at this point where you were a bit. Okay. Up for the camera. Uh, yeah. That's where that mark right there is where my neighbor cut my hand, and this is the spot where the eagle has been. Was right there. I don't have feeling in my hand right here. I was a pretty good beach volleyball player. I played in tournaments, but uh, after that day, I never overhand set again. Everything was a bump set. <laughs> How many shots of Andy then? How did it go? Uh, One second. I was taken to. When he says. I was taken to Santa Monica. Uh, fortunately, in this area, the, amb the ambulances are close by. I was picked up very quickly. I was delivered to uh, uh, Santa Monica Hospital very quickly. They gave me all the antivenom that they had. And then I was transferred to USC, which at that time was the snake capital of the world. Actually, they had all the experts on different snake venom there. So, uh, and I think all in all, I got 11 vials of uh, of anti-venom. I remember late at night uh, they explained to me that uh, uh, the anti-venom is made by injecting it into a horse and, uh, and I looked up and said, uh, well that explains it. And, she, and they said, what? And I said, my craving for hay. <laughs> One of my friends just said, he's okay. <laughs> so. um, um, quick pause. Yeah. Go ahead, but go ahead. But it looked like it. Right. So there are pictures of, of you, essentially, it looks like you're taking the offensive in the hospital bed. But what's happening? Well, you know, it was a strange experience. I remember that I'm watching the news, everything I'm knowing about the news. The first thing that happened that night was Lynn Cottle and the detective from uh, LAPD Intelligence, who I had helped save the police department from Est, uh, showed up and they said to me, Paul, We'll get them if it's the last thing we ever do. Nardis Aquino, who Sinon always believed that we were having an affair, said, here's something they'll never see. And she kissed me on, on my cheek. And uh, 
but I'm watching everything mainly in the news. You know, the news are telling me that I'm critical, you know, that I might die. But the doctors are telling me, you know, that's just what we're saying, but don't worry. <laughs> you know, and I guess there's, well, you know, they're saving their ass media-wise in case I did die. They want to, you know, go on and look like it was their fault. But at the same time, I'm getting these conflicting messages. So all of a sudden, um, uh, I'm wheeled into a press conference. You know, the media was there. The hospital decided, you know, the besieging of requests to, to bring me to a press conference. So when I walked, wheeled into that room, and there were so many people and so many flashlights, I knew that my life was, again, forever altered. And, uh, but I did decide to take advantage of the situation. They would ask me about the Senate on Do It, and I would just say, well, I saw on the news that they arrested some Senate on members, you know. Um, they said, was there a motive for Senate on And I said, yes. But rather than uh, saying Synodon did this or Synodon did that and interfere with investigation or, or statements or prejudice or anything, what I did do is I went into a talk about cults in general, what the cult problem was, because it was big in the 70s. There were so many cults. There was Jonestown, there was Synodon, there was the Moonies, there was the Way. There was uh, so many groups, uh, and, and violence was not unique to Senegal. There was Scientology that had, uh, was trying to destroy people's lives uh, through, the, through the Scientology Guardian's office. And uh, the, it was uh, a no-name speech that just talked about movements in general, why they become dangerous, why, what, we, what we should know, and that it's time for people to be educated. And uh, the sad part about it is that some of the reporters listened to me too well because they boarded a plane uh, six weeks later and went to Jonestown and died. In the uh, summer of uh, 1978. Well, Diedrich, again? Oh, in, in the summer of 1978, before the rattlesnake attack, Diedrich had made a move to set up an embassy in Washington, D.C. to the White House. He was actually invited by a, um, uh, a Jimmy Carter uh, uh, assistant named uh, Dr. Peter Bourne, who was uh, sort of into New Age groups at that time. You know, it was kind of like uh, Carter needed better guidance, but uh, Synanon purchased what was called the Boston House in Washington, D.C., and uh, proceeded to uh, try to get rid of all the residents through intimidation, and uh, so that Synanon could take over the entire building, and that uh, Diedrich would be able to meet with the powers of state. You know, Diedrich had also believed that he was going to win the Pulitzer Prize and he was going to be Time, Time Magazine Man of the Year. He believed he was within, was like a Kennedy or Martin Luther King and that he would be a great man in history. And this was very, very important to him. So now was a move to actually be close to the White House. And, but the press generated from everything that was happening in California and that I was doing was now sort of on to Synanon, and so this was now a media event in Washington, D.C. Synanon had arrived in Washington, D.C. Just as Synanon would move into Lake Havasu, it became an event as well, uh, there as well in 78. The, it ends with Diedrich in anger shoving a photographer or punching a photographer, and an arrest warrant goes out for Charles Diedrich. Diedrich flees to Europe, takes with him his main cronies. And uh, the next thing we know, Howard Garfield has returned and resigns from Synagogue. And we knew something was amiss. And what it was is that Diedrich, uh, one allegation that I've heard was that he began to talk about group sex. The other one was, which was definitely we know, definitely occurred, 
is that he reintroduced alcohol and to send it on and that everyone should get drunk. When it was announced inside Synanon that Diedrich and his people were drinking in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, inside Synanon, where there had been no alcohol or drugs since 1958, and it's now 20 years later, they're having parties. And um, um, when Diedrich returns, he is now an alcoholic. And of course, that may have been an influence to the Imperial Marines trying to kill Phil Ritter and me, was the fact that Diedrich had become, once again, what he was, a down-and-out alcoholic. Um, at the time of his arrest, he was arrested, he was found drunk in Arizona, passed out in bed. Uh, he had to be taken to a hospital and arraigned at a hospital. During the courses of the criminal trial, he was in a wheelchair and, um, you know, eventually I depose him and you might want to ask me about that. The, uh, uh, he then, as a sentencing, uh, the uh, John Van de Kamp's office, uh, and I had actually coincidentally had known John years before he ever became the DA, which I think helped me. But uh, the report was is that the judge, uh, Judge Hogeboom, had assigned his own doctors to do a workup on Diedrich. And they came back and said he was, I think, 66, and they said that uh, ill health, overweight, and that he would, uh, now suffering again from alcoholism, that he would die in prison in a very short time. And uh, so it was put to me because Vanny Camp was concerned that if he made a deal that I disapproved of and I went public, you know, he's still a political man and he didn't want that. So he said, he's not going to do anything, Paul, unless you agree to it. And he said, you know, for the two kids, I already written a letter to the judge saying, they got to go to jail, but don't put them so long that it ruins them because it could have been the kids that got out of Synanon who were my friends. If I had gotten, gotten them out, they might have put the snake in my mailbox. The responsibility is still Synanon's. But as to Diedrich, uh, uh, I didn't really want to be a death executioner. And so the deal was that he could have nothing to do with the running of Synanon. Uh, he could not be involved in Synanon affairs. And uh, 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 that, in essence, was an incredible punishment. Um, and I agreed to it, and he was put on probation. Quite frankly, we all thought that he would violate it. How could Diedrich not run Synanon as long as he could speak? Uh, but from information, is to suggest that Synanon actually tried to quarantine him, uh, try to get Synanon back on track. There was not never any more violence. But we went ahead and destroyed Synanon. You should have. So Synanon at that time, you know, was fighting for its uh, struggle. It was trying to evolve or re-evolve into back to something that was going to serve the public good. I think Synanon recognized that the old man, which is another term he referred to, uh, was ill and a danger, and there was sort of like he was in a retired position with his wife, Ginny and Synanon fought for survival. The problem was is that um, six years after, or four years after the rattlesnake, an opportunity came to me and uh, I destroyed Synanon with the help of the uh, United States Department of Justice. Uh, it was kind of a funny thing. It was uh, uh, somebody in charitable trust wrote a memo in the Department of Justice uh, about Sinon's tax status on the basis of whether or not they were curing dope fiends. They really didn't know much about it. Someone said there's a lawyer in Los Angeles to call, and I picked up my phone, and, uh, and they said, this is the Department, of the United States Department of Justice. My name is so-and-so. We wanted to ask you a question about Sinon, and I said to them, where in the fuck have you guys been? <laughs> And uh, 
I put together, uh, me and, uh, and a Dr. Richard Offshay, who was an expert on sitting on up in Berkeley, were flown up to uh, Washington, D.C. We were hired as uh, consultants, and a lawsuit was filed to say that Sinan, because he committed acts of terrorism between 1974 and 1978, had violated public policy and retroactively uh, should not have been tax-free and had to pay back taxes, interest, and penalties. Using Sinan's own memos, the lawsuit was won on summary judgment. <laughs> it wasn't even a trial. And then uh, Sinan fought it in the Court of Appeals, fought, it, fought the, the, the assessment, the tax assessment and appeals, lost everything. And in 19, uh, 19, I think it was uh, 91, I'm not exactly sure of the day, uh, the doors of Sinanon closed forever. I remember uh, the feelings. By this time, I had a son uh, who was, you know, it was, uh, it was a strange moment. I somewhat regretted it. I was somewhat uh, thinking, what might they become if we ever knew? If we ever knew? Would they turn into, this, you know, a good organization? You know, one way is we'll never know. Once Diedrich was out of the way and his craziness was out of the way, what might happen? But still, in the end, it probably was dangerous. And, um, and it did end. The doors closed. Diedrich spent, from what I understand, the last of his years with Ginny in sort of a trailer home, um, uh, living up north. And then he died in 1997. I remember a lawyer calling me on the phone and saying, Paul, uh, did you hear that Charles Diedrich died? And I said, you know, I will remember you now for the rest of your life because you're the lawyer, the person who told me that Charles Diedrich is dead. And right now I can't remember his name. <laughs> So that's, that's the, uh, the story of Diedrich and the story of how Sinan came to end. I love it. Take a photo. The, um, Just tell us where you were from. How it took it, please. Yeah. Uh, Musico and Kenton uh, had apparently they had a green Plymouth that had come down from Visalia. And oh, they, sorry, this. And, um, um, I actually opened it, I didn't think of the noise. I'd opened it to let cool air out. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think about the noise. Yeah. It's cooled it off anyway. Still wrong. Is that the new shirt? On October 9th, a kid on the block noticed the Plymouth circling the house uh, and told his mother, and his mother said, Well, Green Plymouth is probably the police uh, watching Paul Moran's house. And, uh, um, uh, the, the, there was a caddy quarter to my house was a little market um, and uh, a guy in a black Datsun Z and it was the first year they made 240 Z's in black had pulled up to get a Coke can and saw the green Plymouth and noticed that the license plates had been altered with blue tape shortened to six numbers and the numbers were altered. He pulled over an officer Groh in a police car and said, did you see that car? And uh, uh, Grove said no. He took down the number. The guy who, the Black Dotson, gave him the number underneath it, which came back registered to Sinanon, Visalia, California. And he had been told that morning that Paul Morantz, who lives over here, had been asking for protection on his house, fearing an attack from Sinanon. Well, he puts the two together and he goes to my house, doesn't find anything, and doesn't think to call me and tell me. He makes no report. And the next day, they'll find his notes in the trash can. Uh, 20 minutes later, a California highway patrolman goes up the California incline, sees the same car, pulls it over because the tapes are altered. And Kenton and Musico tell him that, uh, oh, somebody did it sitting on his joke so they get pulled over. And he lets them go. Uh, the next day, when the news breaks, you know, the police officer finds his notes in the trash can and uh, the uh, California Highway Patrolman ends up picking out Kenton and Musico's pictures from license uh, because Sinan people had given them the names of the Imperial Marines. The, the Black Dotson driver was important to put the car by my house and uh, we couldn't find him. 
I used to do I used to drive along Sunset looking for black dots and tried to pull people over. I used to hand out cards. I figured well, it was the afternoon, maybe he's an insurance man, maybe he's a restaurant business, a realtor, and uh, I put an ad for him in the LA Times. Uh, the police gave up sort of thinking he's hiding and I didn't think that a person who would do that would hide. And when the preliminary hearing went on, and just near the end of like a two-month preliminary hearing, this guy in the Black Dots, and he was a, a, a real estate appraiser for a bank in Palos Verdes, once in a while evaluates a Palisades property. And he came back to Palisades, and he pulled into a gas station. And the gas station attendant, I had instructed, hey, if a Black Dotson ever comes in here, you write down the license number. He turned it into the police. And then what, the guy took the stand on the last day of the preliminary hearing. <laughs> so, now, as to Diedrich, uh, it was, uh, they ex executed that search warrant looking for the tapes that I told you of, uh, of uh, uh, Diedrich ordering violence. Sinan had hidden tapes away in, uh, in Kronkson, New York. They, ended, they set up a, a program to everyone listen to all the tapes and erase everything on violence. Eventually there was another arrest, another trial, and, uh, and some people in Sinan, uh, at least one for sure that I know, Steve Simon, uh, went to prison. Uh, the, but on that day that they executed that search warrant, uh, Sinan had believed that it had cleaned up everything. And the last police officer leaving spotted out of the corner of his eyes that three tapes had fallen behind a uh, cabinet. And when he reached back and got it, he found that, you know, one tape was called New Religious Posture, you know, don't uh, send it on. And uh, another one had deal with how they were going to steal the money out of the nonprofit trust into their own pockets. The, I was hiding out in, in Hawaii at a friend of mine's, one of my best friends in Hawaii, and I get a call from the DA's office saying, uh, you're coming back to Los Angeles, you're going back under police protection. I said, why? And he said, because we're arresting Charles Diedrich. You know. uh, Sinan tried to defend Diedrich by saying that the tape was a game-type tape in which he was uh, making things up. But I showed the authorities that he talked about all the beatings in the tape. And I said, every one of those beatings happened. And you can call and get contact the victims. If they say it's not true, you can put the victims on the stand and say all these things happen. I showed them that he was giving a correct history. And finally he says, and now we've trained the Imperial Marines and we're going to get the message out there that you can get, get killed dead, physically dead, and that we're going to get lawyers. The first time I heard the tape was on TV. I was home, living under police protection, my girlfriend, uh, there and they had a hearing on trying to squash the search warrant in Visalia. The judge denied it and said the world should know what's on this tape and it was played in the courtroom. And so there on TV I'm hearing Chuck Diedrich say, you know, you can, I want an ear brought to me in a glass of water that uh, we either have a good thing here or we don't and that uh, we're going to, uh, uh, to teach all lawyers that not to mess with us. Uh, we'll get your wife, and then we'll get you, break your kids on, and that's the end of your lawyers. And um, it turned out to be that was the end of Diedrich. You know, one of the funny things is that one day I listened to a tape of Diedrich in 1976. He was laughing with Dan Garrett, saying that, you know, that stupid Richard Nixon getting caught on his tapes. <laughs> you know, but they all tape record. They all do. And Nixon was one of them. They all believe that they're the great man of history and that how they did it should be recorded. Let's go to another great man. Take a